Uh, one of the other uh, uh, people that uh, frequented your uh, Collier Lodge way back when, before at the turn of the century, or before the turn of the century, famous general from Indiana. Uh, uh, go ahead. General Lou Wallace. Lou Wallace, right, from Ben-Hur fame, you know, the guy who wrote Ben-Hur. He, he, he was a general in the Civil War, and uh, he, he frequented uh, the, lot, uh, the, the lodge up here, uh, all up and down the river, when, when it was used a lot at that time, and he really loved the area. And I uh, just wanted to point that out, because that was another connection to the Civil War. The fact that there's buttons in the area, there, there were many uh, Civil War, of course everybody knows there were no battles up here, but there were many uh, camps around uh, up here. Uh, when when uh, units would form up, they would form up in companies at first, and the company would, would maybe stage in a certain area right outside of a town until they got to be about 100 men, and that's how many were in a company. Then they would go, go to Indianapolis and form up with nine other companies, totaling 10 companies to a regiment, and, uh, and, and they'd form up that way. Also, there were times during the Civil War that various regiments would come back, would come back to their hometown to, uh, to camp. Like, for instance, the 9th Indiana, which is one of the first uh, regiments to sign up in the Civil War. The 9th Indiana actually started forming three days before Fort Sumter was fired on. And uh, one of the companies, uh, Company E, or, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, H was formed up right from Valparaiso area in Porter County, and um, they uh, uh, they were like I said that that was the Ninth Indiana uh, in 1863 uh, 1864 near near the end of the war in uh, no, November uh, October November they came back to Valparaiso area to Porter County. If you, their camp was right. On US 30, where US 30 is now, remember the, uh, where Wellman's restaurant was, Wellman's, uh, and, and, and they had a, um, a hotel there, and there was a hill, well, part of the hill still left, but at the top of that hill on West Street, there's a stone marker there, and it used to be the Stahlbaum's home, if anybody of you remember Stahlbaum's, where they lived, that there's a stone there that says uh, 9th Indiana Camp, and that's from there all the way down the hill and across across the road down to the creek and everything was where the camp, where, where the 9th Indiana camped uh, in, uh, that would have been late uh, 1864, uh, near the end of the Civil War, they were given a 30-day a, a furlough to come back home so that they would sign up. The whole regiment en masse what was reaching the end of their enlistment, so they signed up for the duration of the war at that time. So for that signing up, they got 30 days furlough. And it was the regimental commander at the time who got to pick where they would go for the furlough. And the commander, Colonel Suman, was from the county. So this is where they came for their, for their 30 days of furlough. Okay, getting back to, uh, into the Civil War stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing a uniform of a, of a colonel. It's more of a dress uniform, a dress uh, a cap that, that, that they wore. Uh, they were issued uh, caps like this. Uh, the enlisted men at the time in the regular army were issued uh, hats like, like this, similar. If you notice, the, the, little, the, the hats turned up on the, on the opposite side. The uh, officers were turned up on this side because of the, the swords. You know, they would hold their swords uh, on their shoulders, and it would be on, uh, on their right shoulder, so it was turned up this way. Usually, in the, in the um, musket drill that soldiers learned during, before the war and during the Civil War, those soldiers that had muskets would carry their uh, rifles the majority of the time on their left shoulder. So that's why that, that side was turned up. Okay, uh, another common uh, hat for uh, soldiers during the Civil War is called a slouch hat. Uh, this was mainly uh, worn by officers and Western, what they called at the time, Western troops. Um, any, troop, any regiments from Indiana at that time would have been called Western troops. And uh, they liked the slouch hat because it uh, covered more, kept the more of the elements, the rain and, and everything in the sun off, off their necks. Uh, he's wearing a, a, a bummer there, or a, um, a kepi, some, some call it. Kepi's a little bit different, a little bit shorter, but uh, this is called a bummer or forage cap because it could be used to 
uh, hold a lot of uh, stuff when they go hunting for uh, foraging for uh, for things things to eat and stuff like that. They could use use their hats a lot. But other than that, it really served no function because it, was, it left the back of their necks all uncovered. And, and uh, as the war progressed, it was just a matter of uh, uh, taste, really, of whether they wanted to go with a, a slouch hat or stick with the tradition of what the army issued them for the field, which would have been those uh, kepis and uh, forage caps. Uh, I'm going to let Ken talk a little bit about his, uh, his, 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 his equipment here. Because this is one of the main things of the Civil War. A soldier in the Civil War, the, the privates, the enlisted, and the corporals and the sergeants were the main part of doing all the fighting. And uh, this is the type of equipment that they carried. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, I would actually be either on a long march or ready for siege, given the equipment that I have on. I have a pack, haversack, several weapons. Uh, this is a very basic uniform. It's not very fancy. And really, you didn't get a lot of them. You were very, uh, you had to go out and find a lot of things on your own, given that time period. The weapon I carry is a 58 caliber Enfield <coughs> muzzle loader, one shot at a time. Uh, Indiana units used, the majority of them actually used Enfields. It's good, it's reliable, it's never failed me in the field. I love my weapon. <laughs> well, I've, I've actually, I'm 37 years old. I've had this one since I was 14. 14. So in all that time, it's never failed me in the field. Of course, my father's a Marine, so I know how to maintain and take care of my weapons, so they work. Never failed. Okay, so that's my rifle. And then this is what's known as a siege pack. It's wood. It's not like the rucksacks that they have now. Hardwood, leather. Everything is held together with straps. And in here it's tied. And it's all it is is tarred canvas. Put it in there. You keep all your personal items. I have my slouch hat. Uh, some gators. You guys might recognize those from World War II, World War I. They were using them as early as the Civil War and earlier. Uh, socks, candles, anything I would need on a march. Things from home, letters, clothing. Socks. Yeah, socks. Well, I got my socks on my hair actually. Right. <laughs> this is what's known as a great coat. This is what you wore in the wintertime as your heavy, heavy coat. You could throw it over your head. And Keep very warm. You could also roll the cuffs down over your hands so that you could stay on picket duty and keep warm. Are those hand sewn? <coughs> All of these items are made um, by sutlers. Uh, most of them are hand sewn, some are machine sewn, uh, but they are all authentic and patterned after the uniforms from the period war area because. A lot of the units, when they went out to war, they were still in their uh, militia. militia uniforms. Actually, the uniforms for Indiana were gray at the beginning of the war, so they kind of had to switch to make it a little less confusing. My grandfather's picture. Oh, wow. He was from Tippecanoe County. Mm -hmm. Company D. What regiment? What regiment? You know? It's got a frock coat on. Oh, you got a frock coat? Yeah. He went in in 19, uh, 1861. You might want to pass that around with you. Yeah, that's uh, 1861, Company D, 40th Indiana Infantry, and took an act part in Shiloh, mm -hmm. Perrysville, Bardsville, Stone River, and yeah. he was wounded at Missionary Ridge. So they were right along with the 9th Indiana. Yeah. Actually, it might have been in the 9th Indiana. Yeah, because the 9th Indiana was in a lot he, of those things. He was 14. Wow. He was one of those who probably put the, what soldier, what, what these kids, 
under 18 did, because you had to be 18 years old to join the army, even in those days. I guess so. so what I, they, what, yeah. what they did, well, no, they, no, nah, they didn't. They really what they lie. did was they put, they took, they wrote the number 18 on a piece of paper and put it in their shoe. And when, when, when the doctor, because they had to go, this all had to be done through, through the doctor, the doctor would ask them, are you over 18? And he'd say, yes, sir, I'm over 18. And he's not lying. <laughs> he's standing on a piece of paper that says 18. <laughs> And, and a lot of them, a lot of them did that, and it was a common thing. The thing is, I think the doctors knew it. That's why they made sure they asked the question that way. They didn't say, "Are you older than 18?" They'd say, "Are you over 18?" And it, supposedly they did it that way all the time. So it was like they knew what was going on. I just want to throw that story out there because she said it was, he was 14 at the time. And it was it was common. Actually, I started when I was seven. I was a drummer boy. Yeah, my drum was bigger than I was. Uh, by the time I was 14, I was in the firing line. You were, you know? you were old by then. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was probably the only kid my age that knew bayonet drill in two different languages, French and English. Uh, and, well, speaking of bayonet drill, it's another item we carry. You notice it's triangular bayonet. And it's grooved. They call those blood grooves. They really serve no purpose. Uh, in fact, it was kind of horrifying when you did stick somebody because your rifle stuck in them and you would have to take them all the way to the ground, step on them, pull your gun out. <coughs> so, really, they were not used in combat often. There were not many documented injuries from bayonets. The ones they did get were nasty because they were triangular and it was hard to sew them shut. And you know, a lot of trauma. And you'll notice all the rust and dirt on there. It just made for a horrific, dirty wound. And that's why most soldiers from the Civil War died of disease, not battle. So. But anyway. I also carry my canteen for my water. Simple two dishes welded together, got a little cover on them. Very simple. My belt, which has my percussion caps for my rifle, my pistol, which I'm an NCO, that's why I have a pistol. Right, otherwise, you wouldn't otherwise I wouldn't have that. And then my bayonet. And then here we call it the old 40 rounder. You get 40 rounds in your box. This is where your ammunition came from. You would take this cartridge out. You would tear it with your teeth, pour it down the barrel, ram it home. Dirty and nasty, and when you're on the move, you usually end up with a mouthful of powder. So. Every soldier was required to have three teeth in their mouth Two on top, one on the bottom, or two on the bottom and one on top. They had to be opposing so they could bite the cartridge. All right. They so broke the cartridge. This is what's known as a haversack. And I carry my world in the haversack. I got my favorite mug. And I have my duty rosters, my farmer's almanac, some pictures from home. Pictures of my sweetheart, shell fragment I picked up on the field. Plates, eat with, all my utensils, fork, knife, socks. This is just, your entire world is in here. I mean everything. This is, that's why you put this on first. <laughs> so if you're running from the battlefield and you're stripping your gear as you're running, you keep your haversack because that's your stuff. <laughs> Everything else military can go. You can get more of that from the Army, but this this was your world. You kept everything important in here, close to you. As the war pro progressed, a lot of soldiers got rid of that backpack. It yeah, was, yeah. It, was, uh, it didn't really hold that much compared to what those haversacks right. were. You could fit so and, much more. And they were so hard to carry. They were, they were really hard on the back and on the shoulders, so they got rid of them. This is my coat. Sack coat, very basic design, four buttons, wool, 
my first sergeant insignias. Uh, essentially, I walked up and down behind the battle line, and when they tried to run, I shoved them back in the line. I would yell commands, keep control, keep the lines, keep the ranks, because that was very important in Napoleonic warfare. You had to keep your ranks. Uh, if you strayed in your ranks, you broke your formations, and you were just a mob. So, and that is not how it was done back then. Uh, by those standards, I would be uh, almost uh, naked. Uh, you'd definitely yes. be undressed. Though, yes, I, I have Because you're showing your shirt sleeves. Yes, because I'm showing my shirt sleeves. Uh, any, anything cotton like that would right. be considered underwear. Right. So I, I'm considered undressed at this point. Yeah. But uh, I, we usually have a vest, you know, carry your pocket watch and anything else that you want to carry. And these are also wool. The pants are wool. The shirt's muslin or cotton. You notice the buttons aren't plastic. You guys have probably found a few of those types of buttons around here in this area. We talk about Civil War buttons. Well, that's probably where it came from, that or the coat. A lot of uh, regiments did move through this area on their way through or mustering out. But, and then my shirt, I notice my buttons are metal, tin types. And, you know, no plastic, hand sewn. I would have gotten this probably from home for my mom. And then our boots, our leather boots, all the way around. Got a horseshoe on the bottom. Keep your heel from wearing. Uh, these boots have got a lot of miles on them. They're very uncomfortable. <laughs> well, they're, they're just a uh, layered sole of leather. There is no padding, and it's flat. And your toes are really crammed in there, but once they break in, they get a little better, but not too much, not by today's standards. They're very uncomfortable. But did you have to pay for your own uniform? No, my dad did. <laughs> <laughs> During the Civil War, soldiers were, enlisted men, officers had to buy their own uniform. Enlisted men were issued per one year. uniform per year. Yeah. Okay? Per year. Any, any shirt, per, per year. Any shirts, they got they they got extra shirts from home, or they or they could buy them, but usually they, those were things they got from home. Shoes, socks, um, extra underwear, stuff like that that they might wear, but usually they didn't. But uh, but shirts and socks and uh, uh, shoes they they would get whenever every once in a while. Shoes for infant for an infantry soldier, shoes would last uh, anywhere from one to three months uh, maximum. The Union Army kept their sh shoes supply pretty pretty good. The Confederates were, was very bad because they, the records show that as, as the war progressed, the Confederates had a lot of stores. They had a lot of stuff stored up, but they couldn't get it to the troops in the field. That they had they lost their train. Their their railroads were, were were being destroyed, and they couldn't get the supply out to the troops. By that means. Uh, they were short on horses, short on wagons, uh, so they couldn't get the stuff out there. Um, but, but the Union Army didn't have that um, that problem. Yeah, they even used different materials for their hand. Guns. Right, because of that reason, <laughs> right, they couldn't have, they, steel was, was, was harder to come by in the South, so they made the frame, the frame of the, of the pistol was made of brass usually instead of steel, right. where the Union Army ones were, were, were made of steel. But that's essentially the same gun, just two different sides, given the materials they had to work with. Okay, Oh, Linda, would you like to explain some women things? Okay, we can start. And in my case, I'm not undressing. <laughs> not at all, right? But uh, we will start from the bottom. And basically, gentlemen would turn around and would never look at uh, ladies' undergarments. Anyway, no, I can't even see. husbands would look at the ladies' <laughs> undergarments. Uh, getting dressed for a woman was a family uh, service. Unless you were a wealthy person and had a servant to help you get dressed, your family would help you get dressed because there was no way a woman could get dressed by herself if she was going out. If she was staying home, yes, she could. But going out, no. We start off with basically the pantalets. Okay? 
those we would be, and I shouldn't say those are the first things because actually the first things they go on were your stockings. And they would be knitted cotton stockings. Everything was cotton. Your pantaloons or pantalettes, depending on your age, uh, which you would wear. And those were cotton, they were all homemade. And someone asked if they would be made on a sewing machine. Actually, during the Civil War, many women had sewing machines. In fact, that was the fashion at that time, to get a sewing machine because then you could decorate your own dresses. Up until that time, the dresses were very, very <coughs> plain. They were very simple. During the Civil War, they became very elaborate with lots of decorations and colors. So then over that, how did the pantaloons and pantalettes differ? Uh, pantalettes were a little shorter, pantaloons were a little longer. Okay. For my age, I have kind of in between type thing. And uh, but then you would have on a chemise. I did not put on a chemise tonight because it's kind of hard to walk with a chemise. A chemise is just a very simple, uh, if you would think of a slip or dress that has strapped shoulders going around this way and just going straight down. That was a chemise. And you would put that on and basically it was to help to protect your clothing because you didn't wash every day. So that would keep all of your clothing clean. And on some of the chemises, if you uh, were rich enough, you'd even have sleeves on them. Okay? And you might even sleep in your chemise. It might be your nightgown. Well, how long would it be? Uh, it would go down to the top of my shoe. Okay? Then you would put on what we call a modesty skirt, in case you ever slipped or fell, or anything happened that your dress would blow up. You'd have a modesty skirt. During the winter, like this one, would be a red flannel. During the summer, it would be a white cotton one that you would definitely decorate. Just in case anybody saw it, <coughs> you would make lace to put on it, you would do pleating, you do all kinds of fancy work. And then when the modesty skirt would wear out, you would take your lace off and put it on a new one. Okay? And then over that would come your hoop. And your hoop, in my case, mine is black because I'm wearing a black dress and I'm traveling and a white one would get so dirty and I would never be able to keep it clean for the whole trip. So I decided to put on a black one. Over the hoop then would come your next slip and it's called an overslip. And overslips could be decorated or they could be very simple. And in this case, it's quite simple. And the idea of the overslip was so that you wouldn't see the bony that is in your hoop. And the idea of the hoop was to take place of, believe it or not, hoop was a great invention. Before the hoops, the ladies would wear as many as 12 slips underneath their dresses. So when the hoops came out, this became very fashionable very quickly because it was such a nice luxury. And so then so that you couldn't tell if it was a hoop or if it was the 12 slips underneath, you wore the overslip. Then you would finally get to put your skirt on, okay? <laughs> um, and your shoes. And shoes, this would be a traveling shoe. This could be an over a day shoe because it just has a, a small heel, laced up, tied, nothing fancy. But the ladies did wear other kind of shoes. They did wear heels if they were going out visiting, especially young ladies. And uh, if you were going dancing, what you wear would be something like a ballerina slipper. It would be a material top with just a leather base. And in fact, they, uh, for dances sometimes, they'd be all cloth. And by the end of the dance, the shoe would be worn out. So it was more like a dance slipper than a shoe. Then over that, I, in this case, I just have a jacket that happens to look like two-piece. But also, to help save on laundry, ladies, tops, many and many of them were. You had a slip, separate sleeve, okay? So then all you had to do was wash the sleeve when it got dirty and hang it up, and then you wouldn't have to wash the whole top all the time. They had a, they were very efficient, really. But uh, dresses became such a big deal during the Civil War. Like I said, a lot, a lot of decorations, flowers, ribbons, uh, 
uh, skirt over skirt. Uh, everything <coughs> that was done was to make the waist look longer, this look wider, and the rest of this look tiny. Uh, hats were always worn if you went outside. A snood was worn at all times if you were outside of the house. You would also wear them inside the house to keep your hair clean while you were doing any kind of housework. Because again, women only wash their hair maybe once a week. So they do everything to try to keep it clean. Uh, they were very clean people, except <coughs> that they had to do it a little differently than we did. Because we do because of the daily accessories. Uh, hats were all different kinds, and also they had fashions back then. Uh, this might be something someone my age would wear. This would be something that would be worn for traveling, or a young lady would wear this on a regular basis. Uh, we had shawls. We would have uh, cloaks. We wouldn't have coats, but there would be cloaks that you'd wear, just throw them over. And there was another reason for that, too, because if somebody went out and somebody was staying home, you could share the clothing, okay? So girls growing up, you wouldn't have to make as many outfits for them. They could grow into their clothes and be passed on to the younger ones as they grew up. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention that went over the chemise, which is lots of fun to wear, and it's called a corset. And these were made at home, and you would take them and make them to your size, and of course you string this in and string yourself, and you could not string yourself into this. Your husband or your daughter would have to help you with this, okay? There is no way. And, uh, and the reason for the chemise was to keep this clean and to protect this because this was a lot more work to make than the chemise was. Wait a how does that, oh, it's got hooks and eyes it's on the back? It's got hooks and eyes on the back. Oh. Okay. So, and so what do you start with? Do you have the lace already in and then it's hooked in the back mm -hmm. or do you do hook it first and then lace in the front? Either which way you want to do it. You can do it either which way. Whichever way was easier at the time. Yeah. Depends on what kind of help you got. Yeah. <laughs> if it was your husband, you'd probably do the lacing because of their hand size. If it was your daughter, she could probably do the hooking. Okay. Uh, some of the things that I brought is ladies had more time to do some of uh, the decorating and things like that because they didn't have TV. So their pastimes was needlework, handiwork. And to be skilled at it was something that everybody um, would say. They started at six years old to try to become very good. It was something a husband would look for. Can she make her own clothes? Will she be able to take care of the children? Will she be able to make blankets? Will she be able to do this? Will she be able to do that? Uh, that was so important back then. So uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't see anymore and is tatting. And so there's an example of tatting. And they would do this to make lace to put on their undergarments to show their work. They were, and women were very modest, and that's why a lot of them would go on the outside. The one underneath their skirts. They knew it was there. Other women would know it's there. But it wasn't something they showed off of. Okay, you were supposed to be very modest back then. Uh, women had their fans with them at all times. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember darning, okay? After you knit those socks for the men, you couldn't always replace those <laughs> real quick. So you would darn them and fix them in that fashion. Uh, I brought along a lot of samples of different kinds of buttons, wood, ivory, metal. And um, that is about all I have for this. You don't see the, the shank on anymore. Some of the, uh, just showing some of the bullets. The weapon that Ken had is a, a 58 caliber Enfield. The other, um, that was one of the primary weapons used during the Civil War. <coughs> uh, 80 to 85% of the soldiers in the Civil War on both sides 
use that weapon. That, that, that was made in England. The United States had arsenals full of them when the war started. Um, uh, before the war, the, uh, the raid where uh, Tom Brown, uh, Rick, uh, uh, or, or, uh, when uh, Brown, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and all that business, the weapons that were in that arsenal were those 58 caliber Enfields. Now, this is a sample of the bullets that were fired from some of these weapons. Now, the one in the middle is a, is a 69 caliber, it says, it's got a thing on the back that tells you what it is. <coughs> so, but that's a 69 caliber uh, mini ball. 69 caliber was actually leftovers from, from previous years. What they did was they took and they got the, the smooth board um, 69 calibers and that were flintlocks and they took the flintlock mechanisms off and converted them to, uh, to, to the cap uh, uh, form of ignition and, and then started using these um, mini or mini type of bullets which is the conical shaped bullet rather than the round bullet and it shot uh, farther out of those but uh, the Confederates had a, lot of, uh, had a lot of those because those were left over, like I said, left over from previous wars, previous, previous years and a lot of the Confederates had those 69 calibers. There were a couple of Union regiments that used those 69 calibers also. Uh, some, of them, some of them even had them rifled, <coughs> but the majority of them were still left smoothbores. Some of the other bullets in there are, are 58 caliber, uh, the 577, actually the 577 is the Enfield. The Enfield uh, what was, was the one from, from, from England. It was, they called it a 58 caliber, but it was actually a .577. The uh, uh, Springfield, which is the American-made weapon, which was made during during the Civil War, uh, a lot because they weren't getting that enough from, from England, so they started uh, manufacturing the Springfield at different places throughout the country. Those were a true 58 caliber, and any any of the uh, the Enfield ammunition would work in a Springfield, but the Springfield ammunition, because it was a slight just a hair bigger, it wouldn't work in the Enfield. But, uh, but they interchange those. There's also a round, a 69 caliber round ball in here, and a 52 caliber Sharps carbine bullet in here. You can pass those around and look at them, see what kind of what bullets look like. Uh, the reason that they're, they're, they got that off-white uh, soapy color to them is because it's just the age, because those are, those are actual from that period. They're not manufactured recently. What are they made out of? Pure lead. Lead. Um, and, and that's another reason why they, they turn that color because they, they, those, those were not fired. They were not used for anything. Now I got a sample here of some bullets that were fired and what happens to them and different things. There's also a, a, a shell fragment in, in this thing here so you can look at that. Okay. The pistols that I brought were uh, uh, various kinds that were used during during the Civil War. Um, Sam Colt was uh, um, became very famous after the Civil War. During the Civil War, is what made him famous. After the Civil War, he became, became more famous. <coughs> but what what made him famous was uh, this. Uh, really, was, it was this. This is what started him out uh, during the Civil War. This one here is a is a uh, thirty. 36 caliber, and, uh, and, and that's a Colt. Uh, and this, this one is a 44 caliber Remington. The main difference is, is that the frame on the Remington surrounds, surrounds the whole uh, cylinder there, whereas this one, the cylinder is bare on top. Um, some, a, a lot of soldiers during, during the Civil War preferred the, the Remington. Some people say it was because that frame went all the way around it. <clears throat> to take this apart, to take the cylinder out of, out of this one is a little bit more difficult. This one's easier to get the cylinder out without dropping it, without the, without the pistol falling apart. But it's possible riding a horse, well, it's all, it is impossible to get the cylinder out of this while you're riding a horse you're galloping. It, it, it just can't be done. But it possibly could be done uh, with, with this one. It, because it's a lot, it's a lot simpler and uh, less of a chance of losing the cylinder when they try to take it out. Um, the other thing, the, what I think the real reason why this was more common was because it was cheaper. 
the Colt was much more expensive. Also, Sam Colt came out with two main versions. He called them Army and Navy, okay? They really they didn't mean a thing. All it meant was the Navy one had a hexagon barrel. The Army one had a round barrel. But he, he named them that, and the, the military did, did, did not give them that designation. Colt gave them that designation so that he'd sell more pistols. Um, that, that was his own sales gimmick, because he, he was quite a salesman. And uh, this one is a navy because it's got the hex uh, barrel on the outside. They were, by the way, they, they were all rifled, which means they got the grooves in them for, for, for better shooting. Although pistols could shoot commonly shot both the round ball and the, uh, the kind of little conical shape bullet. Okay. The other one that I brought with me is a uh, Walker. Okay, now this pistol, if you, well, later, later on you can come up and you can pick these things up and kind of test them to get up. This thing weighs a lot compared to either one of those. Uh, right, it feels like almost four times, four times about the weight. It's, it, it, it weighs a lot. To carry something like this on your hip all day long, you're going to be one tired fellow by the time the vehicle. Normally they didn't carry this on their hip. They carried this. This was normally called a, a, a horse pistol. It was carried in a holster on the horse. Um, whether it, the round was a little bigger, it was a little longer with, uh, with the conical shaped uh, bullet. It was a little longer. It was still a 44 caliber just like that other one. But um, the bullet was a little longer and it had maybe a little bit more powder in it, but it really didn't shoot much farther and any more accurate than that one did. <coughs> Bigger because it was used as a club. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then right, then to use it as a club was made it uh, a pretty handy tool. Especially when you're, on, when you're on a horse and you're, you know, if you're using it that way. Um, speaking of horses, I didn't bring, I don't have a saber to bring along, but I brought a, cut, uh, a few swords that, uh, that I have here. This one here is a, uh, uh, an infantry um, officer's sword. This one would, would be used by a, a, a line officer, which would have been a captain or a lieutenant. Um, it's got a little bit, of, it's a little bit orn, ornate uh, on the blade, uh, but otherwise uh, fairly simple. The di main difference between a the sword and a saber is sabers are much heavier, and they're, they're and, and they got a little bit more curvature to them. And the reason being is that sabers were used by cavalry, they were on top of horses, and they could use them as clubs, mainly. They, they, uh, sabers were usually not real sharp because they, because they were used for breaking bones more than cutting. I mean, they were pointed so you could stab somebody with them, but they were mainly used for breaking bones because that saber coming down on an infantryman <coughs> can come down pretty hard and the object is to break the collarbone or break their neck or something like that. One so much to hack things up with. But if that happened, it happened. But uh, it was mainly used as <coughs> for sabers were used for breaking bones. Swords in the Civil War were, were, were not used that often in combat. The purpose of them was mainly for the officer to tell his men where he is in the line also to tell them what, what to do. Because especially when battle was going on or when, or when they were on the march, sometimes you just hold it up like this and that would tell the men that something's gonna happen. Some command is coming, okay? And he's either gonna lower it like that or he's gonna point it in one direction or the other and that tells the men which way to go. Also on the battlefield when it's very noisy and when you can't tell the difference between a drum beat, a bugle call, and bullets and cannons going off, then uh, the sword is what the officer uses to, to, tell his, to signal his men and tell his men you know, what, what, what to do and where to go and stuff like that on the battlefield. Is that blade sharp you were holding it with? Huh? Is that blade sharp no. you were holding it with? No, most, most swords during the Civil War were not uh, sharpened real often. They, like I said, they were mainly used for, for, uh, for communication purposes. Uh, they were not used in combat that much. Uh, swords for uh, officers that were that might have been used in a combat situation was just just, just by accident. And like I said, they were mainly used 
for signaling. Also, during the, as the war progressed, by the end of the war, there were almost no officers who ha had swords on the field because they, they, they just were too cumbersome, They're especially infantry officers. Line, line officers, the captains and lieutenants didn't have horses. They had to walk with the men. So they had to carry that plus a pistol plus their own personal gear because the, the, the person that they had who usually followed them to carry their gear for them, that person was gone, or either either was gone or had to had to be put into the line to carry a rifle. So the officer, so the captain or lieutenant had to carry his own stuff. So he got rid of this. Got what rid are of the this. rings for? What are these rings? The rings these? on the um, yeah. yeah. Those are for clipping to the to the belt okay. to the uh, sword belt. This right. is called a sword belt. And these these things here. That, that's where the sword would hang from, from from these rings. This one would have been worn by a major a colonel, a lieutenant colonel, <coughs> called a field field grade officer. Okay, it's a little bit more ornate. It's got a little bit deeper grade uh, uh, cut uh, in, in, into the blade, made, making it a little more prettier. But um, and then of course the uh, the, the scabbards um, made made better for a higher, uh, higher grade officer, field grade officer, uh, majors and above, uh, something like that. The, oh, by the way, the sword knots, the um, uh, sword knots serve more function than just being a, a fancy gold thing hanging from it. The purpose of the sword knot was to put the, put your hand through on the wrist, then, then you could hold the sword, and if by some, somehow uh, you, you lost control of it, because even, even the uh, cavalrymen, who had sabers had leather sword knots that they would use for those, and that would keep you from losing your sword or your saber if you were, you know, had had to on horseback and had to do something or or, or something came up where you had to break contact with with the with the hilt on it, you wouldn't really lose it. That was that was the true purpose of the sword knot. Then this one is the ceremonial uh, sword. It uh, never was used in a field, never was used in any combat. They were, it was usually a presentation sword. A, a lot of officers got swords like this when they, when they graduated from military school or stuff like that, or when, when they uh, attained the age, uh, the, the rank of, 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 of generals or something like that. They usually got a sword presented to them, which had a, uh, the, a, a lot of gold on it, silver and gold uh, inlay, and the... Um, uh, on the blade too, it was uh, gold, uh, gold on there, to uh, uh, for that and that. But they were mainly just ceremonial and presentation. And this one here was uh, was not really a civil. It was it's, it's a replica of a civil war type ceremonial sword. But this one is actually it is mine. It's got uh, got my name on it. And kind of sort of okay, something that a lot that was very. I don't know if Ken didn't have, you got one of these? Okay, this is kind of something that soldiers use, carried a lot. One of the uh, most important things he had along with that, that haversack was his uh, uh, poncho. Well, he made it into a poncho. It was a gum blanket, called, called a gum blanket. And he could lay it on the ground and sleep on it to keep the wet off of him, uh, the wet from, from, from the ground. But he, he, he made it into a poncho by putting a little slit in here and then reinforcing it with other pieces of other other um, uh, gum blankets, and he could put his head through there and wear one of these as a poncho. What they also did was they decorated the insides sometimes with little game boards. Sometimes they put checker boards in there where they could play, play checkers or chess or something like that on the thing when they were uh, didn't have anything else to do, or they put something on there for different kind of card games or something that they could where they needed a board. Some, some sort of particular board to, to play that sort of game. Maybe, maybe even a crap, make a crap table out of the thing. <laughs> but one thing, any, anything like that, anything, anything that was gam uh, remotely connected to gambling or, um, or uh, some uh, bad photographs or stuff like that that they had on them, they made deals with their uh, partner pards, they're, well, that's what they called their fellow soldiers in their own unit. They were pards, and um, they would make deals that if they got killed, 
all that stuff would get removed because all their equipment gets sent, well, their haversacks and stuff like that would get sent home. And uh, they wouldn't want their family to find out that they played cards or played dice and different wicked things like that. Wow. So they wanted to make sure that their families didn't know that they did anything like that. Okay, so, so they made sure that all that stuff was, was removed from their personal belongings if anything happened to them in the field. Is there anything else? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Questions? Let's have time for some questions. Anybody got any questions? Difference in the uh, effective range between a rifle and a smoothbore? Oh, yeah. Uh, 50 yards to 300 yards. 300 yards. Two, two to 300 yards. One to 200 yards accurately. 300 yards maximum on, on a smoothbore with, uh, with with any power behind it to, uh, to, to, to do any damage. Now, the, the rifled musket, those, uh, those things were known... Well, they, they had sights on them for a thousand yards. Whether they were really that good at the time? Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm curious. You, you're you from around Border County area? Uh, not originally. I, oh, I've okay. been here for Maybe 40 years. Maybe you have an answer then. Oh. I, uh, I did a lot of research on not the Civil War itself, even though I had relatives that were in it. <coughs> but where I live in the south of there was an island called Deserters Island. Have you heard of that? South of no, I, you haven't heard of it? I haven't heard of it. I've heard of it. You've heard of it? You've been there? You know where it's at? I I'm just curious. I, I have, have some there. description for, yeah. of it. Could it have been Civil War or Civil War and or, or Indian Wars? It could be either yeah. one. Okay. They were, that's what they did. It's back in the marsh back and back then when no one knew how to get around that for rivers dredge, it was all swamp. Okay. And it was so thick with willows and what have you, no one could get back in there. Right, so so somebody wanted, it was wanted to get war. lost. And that was, a, that was an that island was out there, a sand yeah. ridge that they that they communed at and they went out and stole and robbed from there, mm. as I read. Huh. That's uh, interesting. I, I, that. I do have documentation of the last man from Deserters Island. And it basically, you know, what he's told. He they, they were groups, they lived off a lot of the wild boar hogs, right? Um, and they stole from the trains, Pennsylvania train railroad came through. They stole there, and I have documented the last one. And he lived to be like 1890 or so when he finally turned himself in. He's the last man on uh, Desert Island, and all I, I think the first thing he asked for was pork because he, they were so tired of boar, the wild boar, and he just said. If he'd known what his life was like, he would have just turned himself in when he was like 18 or something like that during the Civil War. But he said it was just an awful life that they lived on Deserters Island. Um, um, if you go to our website, I think I've got the story yeah. of Deserter Island. Well, see, there's that island down there that was affiliated with that called Sinkatu Island. The, the right. nut club down there belonged well, Sinkatu. Either sick Republican, two Democrats, or vice or versa. And that is uh, <laughs> Ivor Fry. About that. Ivor Fry, and I believe. There you go, I know Ivor. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, well, the junior, the then was Ira V. Fry, which was Ira's five, who just died yeah. three years ago. His father was Ira of D, I believe. That one I didn't know. And it was the 62 Club, and yeah, it was six dead. Democrats. The six Republicans and two Democrats. I can't remember. Right. I got it at home in my in my <coughs> um, it's one of the stories that's in one of our books and I might actually have it at our website. Or if you do a search, uh Lowell Library has uh, all the small stories uh, there and so you can research that one. In the Valpo Library, if anybody's interested, there's a book up there called The Stroller. And it's full of stuff like that. You can get lost for hours in there reading from back then. The problem with the stroller is that um, there were two books, or two, two uh, writers that wrote for the newspaper, and the stroller was one, and that was written by William Wallace, and the stories. Um, and the problem with William Wallace is that if, if somebody is a historian and they're kind, they'll say he's a liar most of the time. If they're not, they say a lot worse things about him. He embellished a lot of the stories. Oh, sure. um, but there, there's a, a lot of fact to it, too. We have, a, um, in one of our books, we have all the Kankakee River Stroller story. Right. And um, they, they're interesting. There's always a certain element of truth to those yeah, that's stories. That's what based on was the truth. And then, then he elaborated. And it took you back to then how it was. And 
Sure. A lot of the original stories that William Wallace had, and actually I've been contacted, William Wallace turned out to be an artist, and it's actually his wife. I was contacted <coughs> by a fellow out of Florida, I believe, and he had some William Wallace's, well, he just had Wallace, and the guy emailed me this picture and see if we could document it, that he was an artist. And we could, but it was actually William Wallace's wife that was more the artist, and she was a Porter County sort of semi-official uh, artist. Right. Um, and this was like a Mexican scene, it looks like a south of uh, like Texas or something like that. Um, William Wallace and his wife, they, uh, she became sick, ill, and he did, and they both suicided. They killed themselves by locking themselves in the garage and started the car, I think it was 1966 or so. Um, but the other fellow that has stories is, and I can't think of his name now, it's also we have two writers, William Wallace is one, he embellished a lot, and the other one I can't think of, it's like Brownell or, or something like that, it just the, took my cup. And his are a little more factual. But you can see, well, William Wallace must have read some of these other stories, because you see several yeah. possible. And, and, that, and then he even embellished a little bit. I know, so, oh, I'm rambling now. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I got away from the Civil War, I'm sorry. Anyway, yeah, me too. I you got me started. Any other questions regarding the Civil War? Yes, ma'am. How, how young were the flight bearers and the drone boys? He said he was seven, but they weren't. Well, quite he, no, he, he was seven, and I yeah, didn't yeah, have yeah, but they weren't quite The youngest young. one known for sure, absolutely, that, that's been documented as nine years old. The drummer, okay? Flight bearers, no. Flight bearers were not kids. NCOs. And flag bearers were important people. Were people you had to show that you were brave to be a to, to be a flag bearer. You had to you had you had to be a combat veteran. Now the first ones of the first regiments that went to war, okay, they 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 very carefully chose who was going to carry the flags because there's no way that they want those flags to run on, 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 in, in, the, in, in the battle without the rest of the, without the rest of the regiment with them. Yeah, okay, it, it was a disgrace. They, but but they. they they wanted them to, to flag because the flags were what they formed on. Right. They formed on the flags. So the flags had to be wherever their commanding officer wanted them to be when he wanted them to be there. Because that's how they formed their line was on the flags. And um, then as, as the war progressed, only the bravest of the regiment got to be what they called the color company. That was the company <laughs> that took care of the flags. And, and, and of the color company, there was a... Uh, Sergeants that were appointed to carry to carry the colors all the time. Um, now, one, once they were engaged in, in battle, they had almost like a line of progression in the color company of who got who who would carry the flag. You know, at, as they were doing, as they were getting shot up and, and everything like that. And uh, but once it gone through, if it had gone through the whole color company, well, then anybody can grab it and and, and, and do it. And, and that happened a lot too. But. Um, uh, it was only the bravest of the brave that got to carry to carry the colors for the regiment. It was a disgrace to lose your colors yes. in battle. You protected them well. Well, and it, would, it seemed to me that the flag bearer would be a prime target. Definitely. That, you're right. Because a lot of times, these battlefields were not flat ground. They were a little bit, you know, the terrain was... was so a lot of times, when two armies were approaching, if one was stationary, the other one was attacking, or they were coming toward each other, you would see, the first thing you'd see coming at you is those flags. You didn't see the men, because the men were usually about six feet below those flags. So if they're coming, over, coming up to a rise, the first thing you'd see coming up that rise would be those flags. So you knew that the regiment was all, there was a regiment of men almost centered on, that, on those flags. So you know, every time you saw a flag, a set of flags, you knew that that's those that was the, how many regiments you were up against, and you knew where 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 to aim, where to concentrate your fire, and and yes, the, the fire was concentrated on the flags. So the flag that the color companies were, oftentimes were 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 the subject of a lot of uh, a lot of fire, a lot of firepower was aimed toward them. They found bodies with over seven bullets in them and come to the conclusion they were part of the color company. Yeah, and that's how they ended up with that many bullets in them. 
the 27 on your hat, is that the 27th Indiana? Yes. Jesse, where are uh, the 27th Indiana Company D is, is not a reenactment group in, in, here in Indiana. It's a, it's a uh, Sons of Veterans Reserve Unit, which is attached to the Sons of Union Veterans Civil War. It's just a ceremonial um, uh, uh, type of, 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 of unit operation. They're known as the Giants in the Corps. Right. The, the 27th Indiana uh, from, uh, at, um, now where was that Giants at a cornfield thing? That was, that was, that wasn't Shiloh, that was, uh, okay. But anyway, they, because they, they were farm boys, okay, and they were all tall. Every last one of them was the tallest of, of anything. So they, so in this one battle, they had to go through a cornfield, and they were the only unit that topped the corn, that, that, their, the ban their bayonets could be seen over the corn. Nobody else is good. So they call them, the, they got the nickname Giants of the Cornfield. And the, tw the 27th Indiana was mainly from the, the cent central Indiana area. You know. Okay. Anything else? And I wondered about the food. Um, I see you have plates. Okay. Yes. Did, you, uh, did they give you rations? Uh, or? A lot of it was salt pork okay. and hardtack. Which is a kind of an army cracker. Yeah. And, uh, the food was not. Hardtack was made of was the, salt, yeah. uh, flour, <laughs> salt, and water. That's all it was. Flour, like salt, and water. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be awesome. That would. Oh, yeah. When they, when, yeah, because when they would be issued this stuff, Wherever it was made, it would take a long time. It would take at least a couple months for them to get the, from manufacturer to the troops in the field, to where, to where it was actually, to where the boxes were broken open and they were issued. By that time, and all the traveling that it had gone through and all the different places that they may have been stored at, it acquired a lot of bugs and worms and whatever else could get into them at the time. Well, or you just crunched it up and put it in water and put it over the fire, made yourself a little paste, and then you would cook your salt pork, and then you would put it in the paste, and that was your dinner. And they did get coffee beans occasionally, raw coffee beans, where they'd have to grind it up themselves. Could you smoke? Um, um, tobacco? Tobacco. Yeah. To, yeah uh, Out of a pipe they, or cigar. It, tobacco was an issue to them, though. Tobacco they had to get from the sutler. The sut the, oh, okay, the sutler... Was you that was a fella who had a wagon, or maybe two or three wagons, if he was a big, big to them seller. And he'd be almost every regiment had a sutler, but some 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 divisions had sutlers of their own too, which had many wagons. And what they do is they follow behind the army. And when the soldiers would be marching, when they go on the long marches, and they throw away things like that, like like that backpack there, or they throw their, you know, that heavy great coat that he showed you, that the heavy wool coat. And that's, it, now, if he had, to, he was expected to have that in the winter time, but in the summertime, what good is it? Okay, all it is is weight, especially if it got wet. Okay, so if he discarded it, the sutler would stop his wagon. He'd pick up every one of those pieces along the road, and when the next camp they got to, the commanding officer would say, "I want, I want an inspection. I want to see all all the stuff that was issued to you." So they have to go to the sutler to buy that back. <laughs> Where did they get the money? Where the uh, privates got thirteen dollars a month. Thirteen dollars a month. You know. <laughs> yeah, a lot of money. <laughs> well, black soldiers only made ten. So yes. Are there, there any civil war round tables in the area? In this area, not right now. I, I, uh, there what used to be one, but there's not any in, in, in this immediate area. Any, uh, right, right now, I don't know what. Uh, there's plenty of people around that are interested in it, but the time is what the, you know, there are people involved in so much. <laughs> Another question. You okay. mentioned though the soldiers were mustered out somewhere in this area. Where exactly did they come from? Where did they go? I mean, where, was there like a general area? Well, now, or something? The, ninth, the, the, the ninth Indiana, which like I said, was the first unit from this area. It was actually mustered out in, um, in southern Texas, right along the border with Mexico because uh, that's where they were sent 
as the war after the war ended, the war ended in in, in May, really. They say you know, Lee surrendered to Grant in April, but the war ended in May because there were still two armies left on the field. One one army never one Confederate army never did surrender. Well, uh, Hood's army went to Mexico and disappeared somewhere. Well, they at, at the time the United States actually thought that that army was going to Mexico and was going to get the Mexican government to support them in another in, in, in an attempt to attack the United States from from the border with Mexico. Of course, it never happened, but there were there were units at the time. The 9th Indiana was one of them that was sent to Texas to guard the border for that purpose. But when it never transpired, then they were mustered out there in, sept in September of, of 1865. Yes, sir. Was Camp Atterbury then? Is that where regiments, no. companies formed? No, there was no. The, there, was, there was Camp Morton. Oh, like I said, all the see, most of the towns uh, didn't didn't have enough um, um, population to be able to form a whole regiment at one time. Usually they formed one, and maybe, maybe you had a town big enough that could form two companies at one time. Well, usually they only formed one company at a time. That's, a, that's approximately 100 men, 100 maximum. By the time of the end, now that meant 1,000 men to a, to, to a regiment, but by the end of the Civil War, there were regiments mustering out that only had four or 500 men because they, they weren't replaced. And uh, so, so they became uh, smaller. But lo local areas usually did not form a whole regiment. Uh, in Indiana, no regiment. Well, except well, there might have been some from from um, um, Marion County because of the population there that could have formed a regiment. But no place else had enough of a population to form a whole regiment from one community at the same time. Yeah. How did they, the Indiana soldiers, get down to? The Walk. You walk to, to where? Oh, the Texas. Yeah, to the Texas. Yeah, they, they, they went by train. The train tracks. But, but they did a lot of walking too. But 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 there was uh, there was the majority of the especially especially at that time that that thing that happened in 1865 and 1866 and 1867 and 1868 and 1869 and 1870 and 1871 and 1872 was transportation provided? Once they were mustered, that's why they were mustered out there. Once, at that time, once you're mustered out of the service, hey, you're on your own. You find your own way home. You know, the government don't care how you get home. Have a nice walk you're mustered, yeah, you're, 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 you're mustered out wherever you're mustered out at. And that's it. You can only read up, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, not necessarily, see, because these were, these were, 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 were state regiments now, if, if they were a regular, regular army, regular U.S. Army or, 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 or the Marine Corps or the Navy or something like that, that was different. But your, your volunteer regiments, once they were mustered out, they no longer were part of the, part of the American military anymore. Okay. Uh, some, once, some of the stories I like to tell um, is uh, some of the advancements that were made during the Civil War because of the Civil War, purely by accident, and by, by necessity, um, the Confederacy could not get supplied well. Everybody knows that, There's especially as the war progressed. The blockade, they could not get, the, they had plenty of cotton, but they couldn't get it out. They couldn't, the, the mills in the north wouldn't, uh, wouldn't take, well, they wouldn't buy it. They'd take it if they could get it for free, but they wouldn't buy it. So, and, and they couldn't get it out to Europe, which really wanted all the cotton they could get but they couldn't ship it out because, because of the blockades. So this cotton bales were everywhere in the South. The surgeons, when they were doing sur surgery, you know, cutting off limbs, arms, legs, whatever, they would take on both sides. The, the, the procedure was one, once the amputations were done, they get put into a ward and the orderlies would go through the ward and they take the sponges and they clean the wounds with sponges and they to put the bucket in the water and they'd wring out the sponge and clean the wounds, put fresh bandages on there, go to the next guy, same bucket, same sponge, clean the wounds, you know, put fresh bandages on it. But what they started seeing was, in the north, they started seeing just the wards would just start dying off 
from, from infection. So, well, we know it today is as infection. At that time, they just said it was for various reasons, con consumption or, 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 or whatever. And um, in the South, what they did was, since they had so much cotton, and they couldn't get spon sponges, were, didn't, sponges had to be imported, so they couldn't get them. So, but they, the, 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 the surgeons told the orderlies, go and get a bale of cotton and put it, put a bale of cotton in every ward, and use the cotton to clean the wounds. So they used the cotton, but the cotton would get saturated with blood, and they didn't bother wringing it out because they had so much of it. So they just throw it away. They'd use it on one guy, throw it away, and go and get another handful of cotton and clean the next guy's wounds and throw it away. They had a higher rate of uh, survivors, okay? But of course, they didn't real. Uh, nobody realized this. Put this together until after the war. The same thing with um, when they couldn't get thread to sew the sutures with, okay? I, 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 after they would do some surgery, they couldn't close wounds with with sutures because they couldn't get thread. So they told the orderlies, go and get the tails, cut the tails off the horses. So they bring the tails off the horses, they try to use the tail hairs, and the tail hairs would, as they pull it through the skin and, and try, try to make sutures out of it, it, it would just curl up and pull right out. So what they did was they told the orderly, boil it and make it soft. So, so the orderlies would boil the water and put the horse hairs in it, made it real soft and supple, but it also cleaned all the bacteria off the, off that tail. So they used the sutures, they used the horse tails for sutures, and but also see the thread that they used during the Civil War to do search sutures with, the, the surgeons would just keep it in, in their packs with all the other stuff. They, they throw maybe bloody bandages or something like that in there with it. They didn't, they didn't understand you know, bacteria and germs at the time. The, the, there were no microscopes or anything like that at that time. They didn't know anything about germs. But after the war, these surgeons from both sides would get together and they'd say, well, I had a, a, a real bad mortality rate in, in, in our wards and we did this and we did that and the other ones with the Confederates say, well, we got a good mortality rate and some of the things we did was this, 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 and this. And they finally came around to, to figuring out what was causing the differences in the mortality rates. And uh, the, some, like I said, some major advancements came out of the Civil War, uh, although uh, 600, over 600,000 men died in the Civil War, and they were all Americans of both sides. So. Yeah, that was the most awful war of the world, because if anybody didn't shot one of these pumpkin balls, more or less lost an arm or a leg, and you didn't survive that. Right, war. right. Pure lead. Pure lead is very, very soft. And when it goes in, it, it's one of those things that it, it, it hits just, just flesh. It doesn't even have to hit a bone. Just going, passing through flesh makes it spread apart. Well, on the velocity, too. It's yeah, a right. low velocity weapon to right. knock you down. Right. The guns of today, well, they, when, they charge, when they charge in with a thousand men, and it, it just mowing yeah. down. Right, right. And they were all shoulder to shoulder, too. I mean, all you got to do is aim it in the general direction. And as long as, and because you could shoot so those rifled muskets, so far, because that was the first war that rifled muskets were used in mass production. Rifled muskets before that were only used by little by skirmishers in the field. Uh, guys maybe got their 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 best right, you know their rifle from home, their hunting rifle. That may have been an expensive hunting rifle was rifled uh, had had the rifling in, in the barrel. Those were, were, were very accurate over longer distances, but there weren't that many of them because they weren't mass produced. But prior to the Civil War, they were mass produced, and, but it was the first combat action that rifled muskets were used in mass. Didn't they also load cannon with all kinds of foreign material to cut more? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was called canister, but it, it was only used at short range. Yeah, well, yeah right, because it, did, it, it, it couldn't shoot all that stuff off very far, but it was very, very effective, effective. extremely effective at, at short, at close range, extremely effective, because these guys were charging, like in mass, they, they were in their lines, and tight, shoulder to shoulder, they were always told, close ranks, close ranks, close ranks, and, 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 and as guys were getting shot, they would have to close ranks and go shoulder to shoulder, keep, oh, keep okay. closing in, shoulder to shoulder, and uh, it would just keep, just, that's amazing. It amazed me a lot of the pictures you see 
that's actually like they're walking into a hard rain because they'll actually pull their hats down and you know hunker down into the charge like it's rain. That's how thick the lead was. And to think that that made them feel better to pull their hat down and you know uh, knowing that, that yeah that's not going to gonna stop any bullets, bullets. But you know if you think it's raining out and mm -hmm. that makes you feel better, you know. But that that always amazed me the bravery. A different time. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But doesn't that gun hold only one yes. shot? Oh yeah, I get three yeah. shots in a minute. A, a, sol a soldier is yeah. trained for shooting three three well aimed shots a minute. Yeah, I can actually get off. Yeah, he, he could get the, the shots off, but they're not yeah, well they're aimed. They're not very aimed, <laughs> but they're panicked. But I can get a lot of ammo out. Oh, speaking of panic, there was a, a a rifle picked up off the battlefield at Gettysburg after the battle in 1863 that had supposedly they claim it had 13 rounds in the barrel. Okay, that means that, that guy tried to put, put a bullet down there with the powder, slammed it down, rammed it, and put a cap on it, aimed it, fired, and but it didn't go off. It, it, the percussion cap went off, but he didn't know <clears throat> that the powder inside didn't go off, and he just kept reloading it one right after the other, and the gun never went off. Because that first, that, that, that one in the bottom got fouled somehow, the, the powder got fouled, if that if that one would have gone off after the after he put the second round in there, it probably would have exploded and, and killed him anyway. But um, if he fired that many times without, I mean, to be able to do something like that when you know the kick that you get from those things, and yet you're so wrapped up in what's going on around you and all 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 the excitement, everything that's happening, that you don't notice that you're not getting that kick. You know, you just keep loading and firing, keep loading and firing, and loading and firing. For about an Amazing. hour, constant firing is so hot that you have to put a bandana around your hand to hold it. And when you're loading it, you take your two fingers, because you know, it's so hot, you're afraid it's going to go off again. And we've had events where we've had constant firing, and you really get into it, you really do, and you. I mean, you don't know exactly how they felt, but boy, you, you get your heart a beating, and you know that's why we go out and do it. It's, it's just a great weekend. You get your friends out there. You're observing history. It's, it's a really good, good time. The field, the field clean these things is, is very simple. It's just, you just pour red water out of your canteen down the barrel, and swish it around and pour it out, and then you put a, a, a dry swab down there as fast as you can to put that out and then maybe just blow through the through through the, the percussion nipple there to blow through that to, to, to make you know to make sure that it's clear and then start loading another round in there because uh, the guys are coming over the hill and uh, gotta be ready for them. She's never failed me. She's, she's been a good gun. Yeah I, I've seen some that failed um, uh, regularly in reenacting. That they'd only fire two, three rounds, and then you have to do something. You have to clean it. Yes, uh, two things. One, I read that uh, Indiana per capita furnished more soldiers to the Civil War than, than more so than any other state except one. Pennsylvania. No. Delaware, no. and you never hear about no, I don't, no, Delaware, 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 you know what I mean, and I was really... Well, Pennsylvania supply the most. Yeah, so, but I'm talking about per capita now. Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, you're right, okay, that might be true per capita. Pennsylvania supplied the most, but per capita, but I don't think that Delaware per capita, Hoosiers, you, you would think it would have to be someplace farther west, because anything on the east coast, so you have, you have to supply a heck of a lot of manpower to be able to make that per capita. So we had mentioned Gettysburg here a couple of times this evening. Yeah, Indiana was, was, was way up there in the numbers. Like I said, the 9th Indiana was, uh, one, of, was uh, one of the few units, probably the only unit that really formed prior to, to Fort Sumter being fired on. Company H was already formed when the stagecoach arrived to tell them that Fort Sumter was fired on. Has anyone here visited the uh, new museum at Gettysburg? Yes, I've been there. What, is, 
what did you think? Did you think were you able to compare it to the old? Oh, it's definitely better. Definitely better. I, I definitely. Uh, the main thing is it's it's more off the off the battlefield, and not it's off the main part of the battlefield. Uh, that and that cyclorama building was really really an eyesore to the battlefield itself. If you know, you know, you know, if you study the battle and you know what happened there. I, I, I feel better not if the, once they get those buildings out of there, the old the old museum and that out of there is going to make the battlefield more uh, conducive to what it was then. Uh, the tower's gone too. Oh yeah, definitely. The tower's been gone for for, for several years. Yeah, that 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 was definitely a lot of a lot of. Uh, if you ever went up there, you feel it moving. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I was up there back in the. We, we went up there back in the 70s, no, 80s, 80s? yeah, okay, 80, you're right, 81. Yeah, because I was little. Yeah, you were little. <laughs> okay, anything else? What is the Sons of Union veterans? Is it truly the Sons? Well, it's actually Sons of Sons of Sons. There are, there are, uh, we know for a fact, of, we're, we're trying to document all of them. Of course, all the Civil War veterans are long gone. The last one, like I said, this fellow here died in 1956, and there's a statue of him at Gettysburg, commend, you know, commend writing that he was the last, okay? Last um, Union. Yeah, the last yeah, Union. Yeah, the Confederates yeah, 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 yeah. he claimed to be Texas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but there are, there are several children of Civil War veterans still alive. Um, of course, they're all old, too, but the thing is, is that what... <laughs> The funny thing that created them was the fact that so many of the Civil War veterans in their old age married young women. Women that were in their, actually some in their teens and early 20s. No, young women married the old men. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true too. But, they got a nice but, 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 but there was, but, right, right, there was a, it, it, it was the, actually it was uh, because the, they, Congress gave this, all the Civil War soldiers a pension. Well, they also gave when if once they passed away, the spouse got 100 percent of that pension, okay, for the rest of their lives. Okay, it's the last time that was done, the only time that was done. But you got to remember, the Civil War veterans, okay, at that time only only men could vote. Okay, women couldn't vote. All, uh, not Confederates, uh, former Confederates couldn't vote. Not in national elections. Okay, uh, uh, they they could vote in their state elections, but they could not vote in national elections. Um, so the GAR, which is the Grand Army of the Republic, which is the the main uh, Union Army Veterans Organization after the Civil War, they controlled everything. Uh, six out of the uh, out of the seven presidents after the Civil War were members of the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, they, you know, and, and and their local governments were almost all right year after year after year were elected as, from their own ranks. Okay, uh, they they had a lot of power, and um, they didn't mind flaunting it. And the Sons of Union Veterans is a, was created by the Grand Army of the Republic. Matter of fact, the, 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 the three people uh, who, who, who started the Grand Army of the Republic, or I mean who started the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, were also members of the Grand Army of the Republic because they had fathers who also fought in the Civil War. And at the beginning, only the firstborn sons of a Civil War veteran could be a member of the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. Now, any son, grandson, great grandson, um, great great grandson, whatever. You had to have direct lineage or what we call collineal lineage, which is if if, if the if, if it was a, a brother or or some kind of connection like that to the to, to the veteran of the Civil War to be a member of the Sons of the Union Veteran Civil War. There's also five female organizations that were also recognized by the Grand Army of the Republic as their Descendants, or they called them the, the Grand Army Family, and that's well. You got the, the auxiliary to the sons, and and you also have the uh, ladies of the Grand Army of the Republic, the uh, uh, daughters of Union veterans of the Civil War, and the um, uh, Women's Relief Corps. Now, the Women's Relief Corps is really predates the 
Grand Army of the Republic. The Women's Relief Corps was actually in existence during the Civil War. So the, 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 um, the Women's Relief Corps is the auxiliary of the Grand Army of the Republic, although you can still join the Women's Relief Corps. It's not, I mean, they're, they don't have a real big organization, but, um, but, but they do exist. As a matter of fact, their, their national organization meets in the same time, the same place, the same hotel that our national organization meets every year. But getting your pension was not easy. For oh, a getting a pension, right. Even a Civil Tough. War veteran. So a lot of Civil War veterans had to, had to really, really prove that they had to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they served in the Civil War. Because for one thing, records were, I mean, th th there wasn't a DD-214. But their the injuries, too, had to be substantiated. The what? Their injuries of where oh, they Oh, well, yeah, right, exactly. Because, because right, when they, when they were wounded or something like that, there, were, there was no, nobody there documenting that this guy was wounded and such and such. Occasionally, the regimental orderly or, or the company orderly would keep track of so-and-so wasn't at a muster because he was in the hospital. But yeah. sometimes, if he didn't put why he was in the hospital, if he just put he was in the hospital, who, I mean, he, could, he could have been there with the measles. And that's not, that's not something that you'd get a pension for being wounded for. Okay. Yeah, one thing I'd like to throw in is anybody that's interested and has a relative or had a relative that was in the Civil War, I would strongly recommend sending the information to the National Archives and you can get all the Civil War records. That actually got me started in genealogy and I sent for not only the military records but your pension records. The pension records is just a treasure trove of information. They'll name all the kids. Uh, if the veteran died first, like in my case, my great grandfather, you know, the the wife had to prove. There's two things that I, I saw is that they had to prove. One, they they left the military at the end of the Civil War and didn't re up. And the other thing is that the marriage was the first and only marriage, or the yeah, first and only marriage. And so you had to get documents out of that. But anybody that's interested in genealogy, Civil War records are just fantastic because of this pensions that was given uh, out of it, because they had to document so much different. So you have addresses, all the kids after the age of 16, um, or they had to be younger than 16. And um, it'll also list their possessions because the widow would have to sort of apply for, the, she didn't have significant, sufficient income. Mm -hmm. So, like in the case of mine, it was that you know, forty chickens, a horse, and a mare, and a, I mean everything they owned, and the clothes on the back. So, just to throw it in, that is a really great source of information. And the last, the last two widows of Civil War veterans, one the one Confederate and the one Union, were both died and were buried within the last uh, five years, about about four or five years ago, one four years ago, one five years. They made a movie. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, that movie didn't come. What, that last Confederate Widow? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that was, uh oh, jeez, now you blew my, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe Hollywood anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, it, it could have happened, but it definitely could have happened, but it, not that particular one. And uh, matter of fact, both of them, we had a, um, while they were still alive in their last couple of uh, uh, Two years before they passed, we had a uh, grand reunion at Gettysburg, where they were both invited and brought, and we had what we called what what the, what GAR and the Sons of Confederate Veterans, or, or, or the the organization of Confederate Veterans, had had uh, like uh, every um, it was 25 years and 50 years and uh, 75 years reunions at Gettysburg, where they had a, what they called hands across the wall, which is the the, the wall there at Gettysburg, that they, uh, the, the, at the high water mark, where they reached across and, 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 and shook hands. Well, we reenacted that with them there, and uh, they, they were the first ones for, with the hands across the wall, which was very, you know, very emotional for a lot of us. And, uh, but then, you know, then, then the, the, the Sons of Union veterans and the Sons of Confederate veterans, and they all did the same thing. And, uh, it was, it was really neat, really neat to see. Anything else? Okay.